Welcome to EPG Pathshala. I am Professor B. Hariharan from the Institute of English, University of Kerala. Today, we are going to introduce this paper on 20th century English literature. The module that we are going to look at is titled Introduction to the 20th Century. The objective of this module is to introduce you to the socio-cultural background of the 20th century. Let's now look at this background. We have to begin by looking at the 19th century for that. When we look at the 19th century from a socio-cultural perspective, what comes to mind is the collapse of the Spanish, French, or the Chinese, or the Mughal empires. We just need to look at history for that. Another important thing that we have to bear in mind is that life was totally transformed by the Industrial Revolution. History books tell us a lot about that. I would urge you to look at some bit of history to understand something of how the Industrial Revolution changed life. There was another very important shaping factor that we have to keep in mind when we study the 20th century. And that has to do with the rise of nationalism and the middle class in the 19th century. The 19th century also witnessed the rise of the nationalist spirit and the middle class. Now this is so much linked to the way in which life was transformed during the industrial revolution. And the middle class was very strong, it was very powerful and that also did in many ways shape the idea of the emergent nation. Now, this was also a time when discoveries were made. The biggest discovery that happened had to do with this classic book called The Origin of Species. There were many historical events through which one will have to go through to understand better the 20th century. I would possibly list out a few of them. It could be the fall of Napoleon in Waterloo. It could be the Opium War. It could be the, the, Indian, the first Indian War of Independence of 1857. It could be the invention, let us say, of the electric bulb. It could be the death of Karl Marx. It could be the, first, the invention of the first radio. And then, of course, we have to, how can we forget the Lumiere brothers and the motion picture. Now, this was a great technological revolution that had a lot of bearing on art, on literature of the 20th century. So, th there is a lot more which is something that we can discover as we read on. I urge you to do that. I urge you to look at the screen and recognize, try to recognize these photographs of some luminaries of the 19th century. You will get a better idea of what I am trying to say. Napoleon Bonaparte, there is Karl Marx, there is Marconi, there is Thomas Alva Edison, you have the Lumiere brothers and of course you have the camera. Now, when we look at the 20th century, the first thing that comes to mind is decadence, decadence in literature, which obviously takes you again to the 19th century, to this classic book by Walter Pater, published in 1885, called, titled Renaissance. Now, before we look at this text, I would like to read to you one line from Ivan Gold who talks about decadence in these words. He says, decline is also a form of voluptuousness, just like growth. Autumn is just 
as sensual as springtime. There is as much greatness in dying as in procreation. This is Ivan Gold. Decadence is a new attitude in life and art to compensate for the loss of certainty. Now, the loss of certainty is something that happened with Charles Darwin in a way and the book that shook Europe, Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, where he came up with this pronouncement that God is dead. The other thing that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the decadent movement has to do with questions of art and morality. Now, in the decadent mo movement in the late 19th century, art and morality were very distinct, separate realms. Decadence as a movement flourished in France. And the poet who was associated with the decadence movement is Charles Baudelaire. Decadence literally means a process of falling away or decline. It signaled a set of interlinked qualities. It also alarmed those who valued traditional norms and values. It was seen as a kind of romanticism if one might use that term. There were painters and poets who were associated with this movement in the 19th century. Rossetti is one name that comes to mind. Another name that comes to mind when we talk about decadence is none other than Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde wrote this novella called The Picture of Dorian Gray, which in a way distills the essence, as it were, of the decadent movement, of art for art's sake. In the preface to The Picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde concludes the preface with a remarkable statement. He says that all art is ultimately useless. Now, take a look at some of these photographs that we have of Oscar Wilde and Aubrey Beardsley, Charles Baudelaire, who I mentioned. The Flowers of Evil was the classic text that came out in French in the 19th century. And of course, the American poet, short story writer, Edgar Allan Poe. Now, the decadent tradition, it has been said, was greatly influenced by the tradition of the Gothic, of the Gothic novels in particular, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, the work, the poetry and fiction of Edgar Allan Poe. A very important figure who is associated in a way, who, who was an explicator, as it were, of decadence was Arthur Simmons, who was a British poet, a critic, and a magazine editor. When we look at Arthur Simmons, we would see that he reflected a lot, he thought a lot about French tendencies, both in terms of subject matter and style in his poems. Arthur Simmons believed that literature of modern society was grown over luxurious and quite sophisticated. He wrote an essay called The Decadent Movement in Literature, which was published in 1893. And there was a very, very beautiful way in which he tried to talk about, about decadence. He said that the decadent movement in literature is, I quote him, a new and beautiful and interesting disease. Close quotes. Now, the very fascinating thing here is to 
look at is to talk about how how does for example how does a disease become interesting now that itself tells you a lot about the spirit of decadence now from decadence it's important that we look at modernism because when we talk about modernism we do it always in relation to the 20th century and there is if we look at it in some detail at least we would understand that there is a link that is there when we look at modernism with the decadent movement now let's try to look at some of the features of modernism we will try and list out three or four of them here now when we talk about modernism we need to be aware that it was experimentation experimentation with what experimentation were experimentation in the arts from the late 19th to the mid 20th century like any movement it also has or had a lifespan so let me repeat it from late 19th century to mid 20th century modernism has to do with the characteristics of what was then regarded as contemporary styles schools of art literature music in other words you are looking at all the realms of human expressivity now there's one other area that has to be also kept in mind to be kept in mind when we talk about modernism that also has to do with not just painting but then perhaps it is related to the the intervention as it were of technology particularly the moving image now what modernism then does or had tried to do was to initiate herald a radical break with the past it was also at the same time a search for new forms of expression now this is where the camera and the film and the moving image became so very very important now this is the reason that when we look at for example modernist poetry we are fascinated by the way in which writers use and link and break and form different kinds of images and with that a world now even as i say this i think it's very important to distinguish between certain terms that can be very easily confused let me list them out one is modernism the second one is modernization the third one is modernity now they are all very different there are subtle differences a very nuanced kind of a difference if one might say now i did say something about modernism now let me try to put this very briefly what is modernization modernization is a historical process rather than a period modernism is a period i hope this distinction is very clear because this is something that we all have to keep in mind now i would urge you if it's possible to take a look at a book published in 1999 by tj clark it's titled farewell to an idea episodes from a history of modernism we had talked about modernism modernization now the other term that i would like to introduce here is modernist who is a modernist a modernist is an artist who makes a deliberate break with previous styles now this can raise a number of questions now i am not going to answer the questions i am going to pose these questions for you to think if we look at for example romantic uh, the rom- uh, the romantics the british the english romantics there are a few names that comes to mind names like william wordsworth or samuel taylor coleridge we would also be reminded of the preface that was written to the lyrical ballads now we have the 
two writers, two artist figures who made a deliberate break with previous styles. But do we call them modernists? So would this be, would this be sufficient to describe who a modernist is? As I said earlier, I am not going to give you an answer to this question. What the modernist does, however, I would say, is that the modernist destabilizes reality. The modernist also felt a growing alienation, incompatible with Victorian morality, optimism and convention. Now this is what really marks the modernist from perhaps the other uh, artists who went against the grain or who thought out of the box. Now, in other words, what we are trying to say here is that the modernist, in a way, was responding to the socio-cultural milieu of the time. He was responding to his immediate past and in a way he was making, claiming that past as his own. He was responding to Victorian morality. Consider, for example, a book like Eminent Victorians by, by Lytton Strachey. Now, Lytton Strachey was not a modernist. Now, this was a text that probably did contribute towards this uh, incompatibility. Or at least that there were writers who did recognize the kind of fundamental contradictions and paradoxes that seem to have governed 19th century England. Now, uh, this incompatibility is so very crucial to, to understand or define who a modernist is. The other point that I was trying to talk about had to do with Victorian morality, optimism and convention. We cannot, what comes to mind here is uh, a person like a poet like Robert Browning who had this famous remark to make God is in heaven and all's well with the world now this was something that a modernist could not accept because there were philosophies there were thinkers philosophers and thinkers who had really changed the way in which you looked at the world you understood the world Names that comes to mind certainly is Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche. Three big names. How can we talk about the modernist or modernism without thinking about these people? Now, look what would happen when we bring in the philosophies by these three people. And then, place it side by side or alongside Victorian morality. Now what we will do is we will try and very quickly perhaps look at some of the major modernist artists. Now take a look at the photographs that we have and the names there. It's very interesting that we have the modernists from different parts of the world. We have tried to identify at least here we have at least half a dozen of them. James Joyce is one person who would automatically come to mind when we think about the modernists. Now, James Joyce is considered a high modernist. Is there a low modernist? So, James Joyce is a high modernist from Ireland. Albert Camus from France is considered to be one, example, one more. William Butler Yeats from Ireland. Now, Yeats generally is discussed, understood as a symbolist poet. We will not perhaps normally utter the names of W.B. Yeats alongside the modernist poet T.S. Eliot. But yet, or and yet, here we have tried to introduce Yeats as a modernist poet. I think it has to do with his sensibility and for the way in which he tried to think in terms of images. Virginia Woolf, 
is another person that would, who would come to mind. And the essay that she had written, Modern Fiction, Ezra Pound from the United States, the better craftsman, as Eliot would call him. And of course, Hermann Hesse from Germany. There are many more. Maybe one could go on, you could probably take a look at some of these names. In painting, you have a whole host of figures. Take a look at these photographs. It will be a very interesting exercise to identify these painters. Take a linger, look at all these faces. You may not be able to identify all of them, but then with some effort, you can identify at least, at one look, at least I'm sure you'll be able to identify three of them, if not all four. They all are identified with the kind of styles that they had. You might be a modernist, but then you would be doing, you would be having very different styles to, to communicate. It could be in terms of your brush stroke, the choice of colors, the material on which you would paint. It could be oil, water, canvas, whatever. It could be themes, it could be social concerns, etc. So these are things that are very interesting. Now, what you have, again, when you look at the screen, you have two paintings. One by Pablo Picasso, Guernica, which was a response, as it were, to the Spanish Civil War. And the second one that you have is by the surrealist painter Salvador Dali, The Persistence of Memory. This is a painting, uh, for me, uh, it's, 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 so, it's so very rich and perhaps reminds you of chocolates, if one might say. You just need to look at the clock, the melting clocks. This is probably the first level, but then I think we need to learn to look at the painting and along with that read the the title that's given the the caption that's given alongside the painting I, th I think that is what completes the reading of modern paintings now when we talk about modern so we we did talk here a little bit about painters and paintings we refer to two paintings now how do we move from painting to literature we will have to go back and then look a little bit, look at the history of painting a little bit. We will not do it in great detail. I would like to uh, very briefly touch upon one school first, Impressionism. What is Impressionism? It's a school of painting that developed in France and it focused on a work done. It was not done in studio but then outside. I mean, look at the word impressionism. It has to do with impressions. Things, the images, the colors, the movement, everything that impinge on your mind, in your eyes. And there are these images that are formed. And then you paint it. So it was not studio work. It could be, this is a place where you see how technology perhaps did shape the way in which you saw the world. Think of looking out the window of a moving train. What do you see? Try to translate that into images. You have Impressionism. Now, when you look at Modernism, the Modernism that manifested itself now in paintings, it did inspire literature. To give an example, think of, try to look at this painting called Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. You have a poem by Anne Sexton with the same title. There is a Picasso painting, The Old Guitarist. You have a Wallace Stevens poem, American poem, Wallace Stevens poem, The Man with the Blue Guitar. De Chirico's, the Chirico's painting. Now, Marcel Duchamp, Nude Descending a Staircase. You have Kennedy's text nude descending a staircase. Much later, you have a play, Artist Descending a Staircase by 
Tom Stoppard. We cannot say that Stoppard is a modernist writer. And yet you have painters influencing writers. Take a look at some of these pictures that we have. The Picasso painting, the old guitarist, and then Starry Night. And then take a look at the poems. Anne Sexton committed suicide in 1974 who longed for the oblivion of death, as if death were but to disappear, to quote her, into that rushing beast of night, sucked up by that great green dragon. And these are Anne Sexton's words. The poem is not so much a howl of pain, but a rather urgent expression of an all-consuming desire. That desire to be overpowered by a force greater than oneself. Look at the uh, Shiriko painting. There's a poem that was inspired, that is, this is a, this is a painting that inspired Sylvia Plath, The Disquieting Muses. And then, of course, we did talk about nude descending a staircase, Marcel Duchamp. Take a look at these paintings and then try to read the poems and then see how different art forms inspired one another, each other, how artists have always inspired each other. Now, when we look again broadly at the socio-cultural background of the 20th century, there are a number of things that really strikes you. We will perhaps quickly look at some of these things. The advancement in scientific knowledge is one thing. And a very good example would be the, the invention of the camera, the, the invention of um, the radio, the code, the Morse code, the way in which it was used, let us say, during the two world wars. Think of the war poets. They wrote letters, letters that reached home, letters that did not reach home. Look at the war. The war itself was fought because there was this technology that was available. Think about the vocabulary war gave to the second, uh, during the 20th century. You would see something of that being anticipated in the poetry of Thomas Hardy, of all people. Now, think of the economic depression of the 1930s after the First World War. That had a lot of bearing on 20th century writing. Think of modernism. We have talked about modernism. Think of postmodernism. So we are not going to talk here about postmodernism, but then I think at this point one needs to be aware that we did have modernism and we perhaps we had postmodernism, or one might say we are now living in the postmodern age. The other thing that we have to bear in mind when we talk about the 20th century has to do with decolonization. We know that there were uh, European nations that did have many colonies, but then with the Second World War or after the Second World War, many of these colonies became free. And now this had a significant impact on the way in which literatures in English evolved after the Second World War. The two world wars, of course, Indian independence from the British Raj, 1947. Now that is very, very important when we talk about the whole process of decolonization. That's a very, very broad area, but the, uh, what, we, what we want to do here is to introduce this whole idea of decolonization. Now, the 20th century has certainly been described as an age of interrogation and anxiety. Now, I think this is something that would fit fairly well the 20th century because we, we could now see, by now see, the kind of things that were the systems, the structures, the philosophies, the thoughts that were interrogated. The anxieties that were shared by these writers, right? This, I would say, was manifest 
remarkably, let us say, in existential philosophy. The rise of the women's rights movements, sexual freedom, right? And then, after the Second World War, did we have any wars? Battles? Perhaps not. But then we did have the Cold War. Now, battles? Perhaps no. But then did we have wars? We did have the Cold War. No, no gun was fired. No cannons were fired. But then, that was a different kind of a war. And what has happened to this world with the cessation of hostilities, as it were, of the Cold War. There were two superpowers, let's say, that emerged, that, that came up. And you, are, you were with one superpower or with the other. And there certainly was this battle, as it were, this war of, let's say, it was not, as I said, of cannons, but then this was a battle more of ideologies, belief systems, economics, power. Now, has this Cold War ended? We have to ask this question. Are there other forms of wars that we witness today? Now, this is a very important question to ask when even when we talk about modernism or even when we talk about the kind of writing, the kind of literature that came up in the 20th century. Broadly speaking, when we look at the timeline of the 20th century, now let us very quickly look at some of the major events, not everything. Now, uh, when we think, for example, of the 20th century in terms of technology, we will have to think about the Morse code that was sent across the Atlantic Ocean. That was science. And that had a tremendous impact during the World War. Now, Albert Einstein, Einstein's theory of relativity, look at the way in which it impacted the war. Look at the discourses, look at the stories that came about war, about peace. Think of the war poets. Think of the kind of literature, the stories that came after that. Think of Another remarkable thing that uh, a tragedy that happened that became the subject of a motion picture much later. But then, before the tragedy, think of this, the biggest ship ever to be built in the world, the Titanic. With the, first, the ending of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. But that did not stop people from fighting. You have the October Revolution, the creation of the USSR and then of course today there is no USSR there is only Russia and then when we talk about the two world wars in between of course we have to talk about the Great Depression the Great Depression in 1939 the 30s the Second World War and then of course two dates in the 20th century that we can never forget which in a way links to one of those remarkable uh, discoveries of the 20th century, Einstein's theory of relativity. And that has to do with August 6th and August 8th, 1945, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atom bomb. And then, of course, the end of the World War. Now, this pretty much structures some of these ideas that you've been trying to share about modernism. In this module, we have looked at some of the major impulses that shaped 20th century writing. We have tried to identify uh, or distinguish terms, terms like modernism, modernization or modernist. We have looked at the impact the world war had we have looked at the impact of technology we have looked at how uh, how various forms of representation or expression rather more than representation i would say expression shaped radical thought question structures 
created perhaps uh, a new way or a mode of looking at the world right so this is what we have been trying to show here we have tried to uh, look at the increasing uh, impact the, the big impact that scientific discoveries uh, have had on the way in which you relate to the world uh, we have tried to look at the trauma of the world war we have tried to see how uh, again technology seemed to have um, transformed the world and how literature i would say ultimately became very urban i think this is probably the take away as it were if you look at this module i would now ask you to look at the e text and the powerpoint try to address the questions that we have so that you would be able to form your own ideas and it probably would also help you motivate you to look at some of these texts that i have indicated thank you